My name is Keith Burrows. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this boot camp, which I think is uh, really a fantastic initiative. Um, I'm the senior manager of low carbon buildings for the Atmospheric Fund. I manage our retrofits team and I'm responsible for all of our retrofit projects and activities related to decarbonizing the built environment. Um, a little about my background. I have an educational background in computer science and sustainable design studies. Um, I was a computer programmer and a technology manager for the early part of my career. And, and I transitioned to a career that focused on decarbonizing the built environment about uh, 10 years ago. Um, when I made that transition, I started, I launched a company that provided consulting services and developed a, an operational rating system for homes. Uh, and then I joined TAF, the atmosphere going to work on scaling retrofits and decarbonize uh, buildings. So uh, the Atmospheric Fund, or TAF as we're known, is a nonprofit. We're focused on identifying uh, climate solutions and trying to, to scale them up for broad adoption. We're founded in 1991 from an endowment from the city of Toronto. Um, and then we've been, we've had subsequent endowments from the province of Ontario and the federal government. So our original focus was climate mitigation work in Toronto, and now we have expanded uh, to work in the GTHA. Um, our projects are in the GTHA, but we collaborate with organizations uh, across the country. So um, our mandate is climate mitigation and uh, our work really focuses on, we provide um, grants to nonprofits and municipalities that are doing um, climate related work. We do uh, impact investing, so we'll invest in companies that are doing uh, climate related work. And um, we do policy advocacy and we do programs. And a big part of our program work is what we're calling the, the Retrofit Accelerator. It's our, our Retrofits program. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what that is a, a bit later. Um, but we've been doing uh, retrofits as part of our program work for over 10 years in the multi-residential space. We have quite a bit of experience there. And then um, over the last four years, our retrofits have, have focused exclusively on projects that incorporate heat pumps of, of, of one type or another. Um, we partner on retrofit projects with uh, all types of building owners, social housing providers, uh, also private apartment buildings and uh, condominiums where we're seeing quite a bit of interest at the moment. So uh, as I mentioned, we've been doing retrofits for over 10 years, exclusively in the multi-residential space. Um, we have retrofit over 3,000 homes at this point. Most of them have been in social uh, housing. Um, and although again, we've done some in the private departments in condos as well. Uh, over this time, we've developed uh, a continuously improved a delivery process uh, that um, allows us to provide uh, retrofit services for a building owner. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And we've collected millions of data points as part, as part of our monitoring research and optimization work. So some of the data we've collected has gone to help our own research initiatives and improve our retrofit delivery process and retrofit outcomes. Um, some of that data, we've collaborated with academic institutions on research initiatives and publications. And then we've also provided data to government organizations that are looking for um, data to back up uh, policy changes or standards. And then now with our retrofit work, our, the, the, our earlier retrofit work was focused on, you know, making sure we got to at least 25% emissions reductions and now we're looking to go deeper and to scale that work. And uh, when, when we talk about going deeper, we're talking about deep retrofits and we're defining uh, deep retrofit as 40% um, emissions reductions or more. That's how we're defining it today based on the, on the market. Um, and you know, that, that definition is certainly subjective, but the case for doing deep retrofits is, is compelling, right? There's um, deep retrofits, of course, uh, help on the emission side of things. Um, which you know we you know, we have no choice but to, to retrofit almost all of our buildings if we have any chance of of decarbonizing the um, you know existing building stock and meeting our climate goals. Um, there are also synergies and potential cost savings when you tackle multiple retrofit measures in parallel. And the the common example here, or kind of like a frequently used example, is if you're doing envelope work at the same time you're doing mechanical system upgrades, then you could potentially downsize your heating and cooling systems, which will lead to increased comfort and, and cost savings. Um, but there are numerous examples where you can, you'll see synergies and, and potential savings. Um, in, improved resilience is another one. Uh, in particular here, uh, we're seeing you know, uh, significant improvements in avoiding extreme heat events. Um, 
and this is through envelope improvements, but also uh, primarily through um, the introduction of cooling with uh, heat pumps on these projects. And then of course, improved comfort and indoor environmental quality for residents uh, is, is a significant benefit and one that we try to, to focus on in our design. Um, and then just one thing to note on, on deep retrofits, um, you know, oftentimes people like to talk about deep retrofits as this one huge massive uh, kind of project and that is the, the ideal way to do them, but it's also perfectly fine to do them in steps over time, as long as there's a path uh, a, you know, a, a very solid path to getting that building to to near zero, and the project and the the projects are basically walking the building down that path over time. That's actually largely how a lot of these retrofits are ultimately done because of cost constraints or other constraints. Um, and yeah, and although there are, are many many benefits to deep retrofits, um, they're not happening nearly fast enough um, to beat our our, our climate goals. Um, this is a, just an example that kind of shows. Um, how far behind we are to a certain extent. The blue line here is kind of the business as usual pace of, um, of retrofits, what we're doing today. And here we're looking at all the multi-residential units uh, in Canada. And the orange line is where the pace that we need to see uh, to decarbonize uh, existing MERBs, uh, multi-residential buildings um, by 2050. Um, and you know, some would argue that 2050 isn't ambitious enough at, by itself, but really the, I just wanted to kind of illustrate that we're uh, far behind on the, on the pace we need um, to retrofit our existing buildings. What this graph doesn't show you is that even the retrofits that are done today are, are relatively shallow. Uh, so they're not deep retrofits, most of them. So not only do we need to increase the, the pace of retrofits, we also need to increase the ambition of those retrofits as well. A lot of work to do. So, you know, we, TAF has a great deal of experience with retrofits in, in multi-residential buildings. We also have even more experience working with building owners and trying to convince them uh, to take on these retrofits. It is very difficult, uh, even with, when we're providing financial incentives and uh, free services to help, um, you know, building owners navigate these, these retrofits, it's still not an easy sell to make these projects happen. Uh, and we've used the experience that we've gained over the last you know, 10 years, along with research and analysis of retrofit barriers in order to determine some strategies that we could undertake to try to address those barriers. And ultimately, you know, we, I see like the, the retrofit barriers can kind of, kind of be boiled down to three key kind of categories. You could argue that there would even be, you know, um, that could be narrowed down further to two, but I have three here for today. The first is financial. Uh, this is the most significant barrier, uh, high upfront costs and long payback periods is um, the, you know, certainly the most uh, obvious deterrent. The second are what we call organizational barriers, and this is really project complexity and the perceived risk of retrofits. And then the third are the market capacity, which is you know, really the fact that there's an underdeveloped market for retrofits, which leads to both high cost of retrofits and um, you know, and complicated projects with uncertain outcomes. So, you know, that's why I'm saying you really could kind of, um, you could boil these down to two barrier, barrier categories. You know, there are many different barriers to deep retrofits, but, you know, these are the primary categories in our view. So let's tackle the first barrier, which is the, the upfront cost barrier. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, there are many benefits to deep retrofits, but most of these are not monetizable by the building owner today. And these you know, public non-monetizable benefits include the public health benefits from avoided fossil fuel con, um, consumption and the, the health benefits of the occupants themselves, um, avoided energy infrastructure expenses, reduced carbon emissions and improved resilience. Um, there is a, certainly an argument that public investment in deep retrofits, not only would it create demand or help to create demand for deep retrofits, but it would also yield significant public benefits. And we've been advocating for public funding of retrofits and uh, for market development work. And we see this as critical to, to scaling deep retrofits in the, given the market that we have today. Um, our advocacy has led to $200 million being allocated in the federal budget um, for retrofit accelerator work. Again, I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment, but that's really kind of market development and retrofit scale work. Um, and the budget, the budget also includes 33 million to develop like a neighborhood retrofit program kind of based on the Dutch energy sprung model, which I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with. And obviously this is a really good start, but more 
uh, public funding is needed uh, to meet uh, our to generate the scale that we need to meet our goals. And um, you know, as part of this addressing this financial barrier, uh, we also invest in the the projects that we're working on. We'll provide a financial incentive, usually upfront in the kind of preliminary design feasibility study phase uh, to help make these projects go. Um, it's just one other way that we're trying to address this the, this particular barrier. And um, you know, just one thing to, that I want to highlight is that the the cost barrier is the the most significant barrier, but just addressing this one barrier is not going to generate scale. So just throwing money at the problem um, won't generate scale unless we address the complexity barrier as well. Okay, and you know, if if you're interested in better understanding the gap between the, the kind of uh, retrofit funding today and spend and where we need to be to generate scale. I highly recommend these two reports, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, both of them are based on modeling that was done by Ralph Torrey, who's a director of research for Corporate Knights. Um, the Pembina Institute's report, which is the Canada's retrofit wave, a renovation wave, they're advocating for public funding of 10 to $15 billion per year over the next 20 years to generate scale and deep retrofits. And they argue that this investment would create more than 200,000 jobs, 48 billion in economic uh, development every year, and would pay for themselves twice over through increased tax revenue. So um, uh, uh, would, this would be a good financial uh, investment for, um, for the federal government. And then the Canada's Climate Retrofit Mission, which was done by Efficiency Canada and Carleton University, they, they make the case that we need to see an additional 20 to 32 billion in retrofit spending annually over the next 20 years, just looking at that 20 year uh, time frame, uh, to decarbonize all of the, the 10 million buildings in, in the Canada's existing building stock. And we could certainly argue over what the exact numbers are, like what's the right level of uh, public funding that we need. But what's clear from these reports and from our own work is that we do need public investment in retrofits to generate scale, uh, given the, the kind of like the, our landscape today, and that that investment will generate economic returns and significant public benefits. So it's, it's really a sound investment. And so, um, you know, one question that, that, you, that people often ask is, well, can we unlock the business case for deep retrofits today with the tools we have? Like, what if we don't get public funding or we can't get more public funding? And, you know, there are a couple of tools for reducing costs or changing the business case. And one, of course, is the carbon price. Um, and this will make deep retrofits economically viable, especially electrification projects. Um, but that won't happen until it's too late. Um, it's it, the, the carbon price is definitely factoring into decision-making today. We're, we're seeing that with the building owners we talked to, but it's not yet driving real demand for deep retrofits. Um, we can also reduce costs through uh, building up the industry and institutional capacity for retrofits, but that uh, needs to happen now as a time-consuming process. And it's largely driven by learning by doing, by actually doing retrofits. And then of course, um, there, there's cost savings to be had through aggregation and uh, economies of scale, um, but this requires large scale, large scale demand uh, in order to do this. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem. It's really difficult uh, to generate, uh, to, to develop the in industry capacity or to do uh, you know, cost savings from economies of scale without first having demand for deep retrofits. And this is why we really think the public funding is necessary to, to begin to increase the, uh, this demand. Okay, so um, the second key barrier is what we call the, the kind of the organizational barrier, which is the project complexity and the perceived risk uh, of deep retrofits. And to help address these barriers, we've developed an approach to supporting building owners uh, with through the retrofit process um, over that kind of 10 years we've been doing retrofits. and. You know, we really try to partner with the building owner as a trusted uh, public entity with a great deal of retrofit experience. So really coming in as an expert, uh, as a trusted expert. Uh, we really, the goal is to try to take steps to reduce the complexity of the project from the perspective of the building owner. Um, we try to take on as much of that, com uh, of that complexity as we can and just make the process um, a, little, a little smoother, a little less complex. Um, we provide quality assurance and measurement and verification support to kind of to, to somewhat de-risk the project uh, from the building owner's perspective, right? So we wanna ensure that the retrofits are performing as expected, which is always a, a concern. 
that uh, we're seeing the outcomes that we expect. And we help uh, building under secure funding uh, for retrofits and often provide some initial funding ourselves, which I mentioned. Uh, and we're, you know, of course, focused on carbon emissions, but we're also solving for other benefits um, at the same time. And, you know, we're, again, we're looking at 40% emission reductions and looking to go deeper over time as the market develops and costs come down. So we really believe that um, to address this kind of second barrier, this complexity barrier, uh, we need organizations that can help building owners navigate the complex process of a deep retrofit. And, you know, we've taken that process that we've developed over the, over the time we've been doing retrofits and we've launched what we're calling a retrofit accelerator. Um, and we, what we want to see is we want to see similar organizations doing the same kind of work throughout Canada. And this is helping building owners navigate the process, helping get retrofits done, and helping really develop a market for deep retrofits. And we believe these entities, at least initially, should be um, public interest entities. So public service, um, uh, nonprofits, or municipally run organizations that building owners uh, and their partners uh, will trust. And some of the services that these retrofit accelerators can provide um, to building owners specifically would be that streamlined access to public funding. So really helping uh, to tap into public funding, helping with the application process. The accelerators will be aware of the funding that's out there where building owners may not be. Um, they can help on the procurement and project management side of things, um, including contracting uh, as well. And then um, very importantly, technical and communication support. So. In this includes quality assurance of design and construction work, uh, measurement and verification, uh, making sure the, the retrofit is performing as expected, and then to helping the building owner take steps to, uh, and working with building uh, retrofit partners to take steps to improve um, any systems that may need to be optimized. Um, and then also support with the communications in general and uh, with resident engagement, which is a critical piece of these uh, retrofits. And not only will the, the retrofit accelerators do they provide uh, these services to building owners, but they also can help us develop a, an increasingly efficient market for deep retrofits. They can uh, aggregate and organize demand and really send a signal to the market that there's demand for these type of uh, projects and work. Uh, can support standardization of retrofits and components of retrofits and even uh, eventually kind of the industrialization of, of, um, of retrofits. Um, we think about uh, Project delivery is one one area where we, where we think that there's the need for standardization, but also um, like prefabrication and overcladding and in uh, and HVAC solutions as well. Uh, they can also maximize health, social, and economic outcomes. So really make sure those public benefits are front and center on these projects, and then importantly ensure that lessons learned on the projects. Uh, are shared broadly so that uh, we avoid wheel creation as much as possible. We don't have time uh, for, um, for other entities to recreate the wheel. We really want to focus on cooperation uh, instead of competition. Okay. So with our own retrofit accelerator, um, we currently have about 1,200 um, multi-residential units that are in, in process. So they're either in design or in construction or in close retrofit monitoring. And our plan is to scale up the ambition and the number of retrofits we're doing each year uh, until we can kind of de help develop a market for, uh, for retrofits and accelerators at some point will no longer be needed. And we're no, I don't mean to say that we're gonna do this by ourselves. Again, we wanna see Multi, you know, numerous organizations across the country doing the same kind of work uh, and really helping to build this market. Um, we are doing retrofits with social housing providers, with private apartment buildings, and with condos. Um, those are those are very three different um, three very different building owner types with very different views on retrofits. Most of the projects we're doing are with social housing because they tend to have a longer term view of the investments into their buildings. Um, there's quite a bit of need in that space in terms of asset renewal. And there are some, some very generous funding programs at the moment, particularly through, through FCM uh, for that building type. Um, most of our projects are now are holistic, what we call holistic in nature, which means we're focusing on envelope uh, as well as mechanicals. We do, some projects are, are specific to, and we're just looking at the mechanical systems, which uh, in my opinion is totally, uh, is totally acceptable. Um, but you know, a lot of the, the more recent projects we're doing are kind of holistic, and some of those projects are looking at uh, obtaining like near passive health levels of performance, 
Uh, and one of the projects is actually going after passive house certification uh, and if it's certification, which is we're really excited about. And then the projects we were installing technologies we've explored and are using heat pump technologies of all different types. Um, we're doing geo systems. Uh, we're looking at district energy systems that use geo as well as um, wastewater heat recovery. Uh, we're looking at prefabricated uh, insulated um, overcladding panels and hybrid heating systems that use uh, you know electric heat pumps for primary um, space heating and provide cooling with gas systems uh, providing uh, peak heating needs uh, as well. Um, and of course, all the projects we're looking at, we usually evaluate for whether or not they're suitable for um, solar PV for photovoltaics. And then we're collecting a lot of data um, as part of the, the retrofit projects we're doing. Um, we do you know, research projects, as I mentioned earlier, um, and we're, trying, we're always looking to try to improve our work and our retrofit outcomes. We collect uh, pre and post retrofit uh, energy consumption data. Sometimes it's just at the whole building level. Sometimes we're submetering different systems depending on, on the retrofit. Um, we're looking at carbon emissions and savings over time, and then how that compares to our, the pre retrofit models. Um, we look at um, retrofit costs by measure, uh, which is really important. It helps us to estimate future projects, but also gives us a sense of how the market uh, is changing based on costs for specific measures. And you know, our, ideally, we're seeing uh, costs come down um, for specific measures over time. Um, and for all of our projects, we conduct pre and post retrofit surveys. So. We really want to get a qualitative sense of how the retrofit is impacting occupants um, and the pre retrofit surveys, the results from that will often inform our design work and the post retrofit surveys help us to improve our retrofit processes uh, and potentially um, improve any, um, you know, any shortcomings in the retrofit itself uh, on a particular building. And then we're also collecting indoor environmental quality data for a subset of units that we work in. We'll recruit volunteers, uh, we'll install metering equipment. Um, again, we try to do pre-retrofit and post-retrofit so we can have a bench, uh, benchmark that we can uh, evaluate against. And we're looking at, um, you know, depending on what the retrofit measures are, but usually we're looking at temperature and relative humidity, um, CO2, uh, volatile organic compounds, and particulates, uh, PM 2.5. And then we're also um, tracking the hours uh, worked by people facing barriers to employment on our projects. So, we like to work with um, uh, we like to work with um, what we're calling social contractors. Uh, building up is an example of a social contractor that we work with a great deal. Um, they provide skills training and wraparound services to people who are facing barriers to employment. And so we see this as both addressing an equity issue and then also helping to build uh, capacity um, in the industry that's much needed. Okay, and here's um, our theory of change at, at a very high level. So uh, we're accelerating retrofits uh, and helping to build capacity and develop the market for, for deep retrofits. Uh, this allows us to, tr to try to compress costs to address some of that, um, that, that first barrier, the cost barrier through aggregation, uh, standardization, and eventually industrialization. We're measuring and highlighting the social and climate benefits of this work which informs our policy advocacy. And, and, and all of this kind of creates a foundation uh, for policy changes like the existing buildings performance standards that we see in, in New York City. And then this is just a virtuous cycle. If, as policies are enacted, we see more retrofits, the market's further developed uh, and, and on it goes. Um, and of course, policy, um, you know, policy can have the biggest impact on and generating you know, scale in deep retrofits, but um, the problem is we have to have a market in place, at least started, uh, somewhat developed before um, governments will regulate. There has to be uh, demonstrated capacity to deliver retrofits at scale so that the industry isn't overwhelmed when, you know, when standards or requirements are enacted. And then the, the economic and social and climate benefits need to be demonstrated and well known so that the policy can be easily justified. And then we need to make sure that there are cost effective and scalable solutions so that um, you know, when st existing building standards, for example, are put in place, the cost of actually meeting those standards isn't exorbitant or else there will be, uh, <laughs> there will be uproar and, and, and an extreme pushback. Okay, and um, you know, in addition to kind of developing the market through 
you know, through generating scale or pre-scale, uh, we're also taking some, we're, we have some very specific activities we're looking at to, to identify specific markets. Um, and these include, we have an initiative to pre-qualify prefabricated overcladding panel providers. It's, um, it's quite a mouthful, but we're trying to really send a signal to the market that there's demand for prefabricated overcladding in the retrofit space. And we're trying to convince um, entities that are currently working in this space in new construction to, to start to focus on, on retrofits because there is demand there now and there's going that is only going to increase over time. We're working with Toronto Community Housing on that initiative. Um, and they're also doing something quite similar with windows and trying to expand the market for like passive house level performance uh, windows, which is a fantastic initiative. Um, we're also researching the potential benefits of uh, an application of aggregation and bulk procurement to drive down costs and increase the installation quality of heat pumps. And we're working, um, we're, we're demonstrating and doing projects with integrated project delivery to try to, to optimize the way that we uh, deliver our projects. Um, integrated project delivery is, a, is kind, of a, a kind of a radical approach to construction delivery that um, it contractually establishes the participants as equals um, and tries to establish, a, um, I guess, a project culture that's built on collaboration and transparency. Um, we see this as, uh, yeah, as key. Like, not only do we want to see the market develop for like specific technologies and solutions, but also in the way that we deliver these projects, that also needs to dramatically improve as well. Okay, so just a quick summary of addressing the addressing barriers to deep retrofit. So. Um, on the, the financial barrier, we think public funding is, of retrofits is needed, and um, you know we're supporting projects financially to help get them started. We're trying; that's how we're trying to address this, this particular barrier. Um, on the organizational side of things, the the complexity barrier, um, retrofit accelerators can help here. They can help building owners navigate the complex process of a deep retrofit and manage and, and help to ensure that we're getting quality outcomes from the retrofits and ensure that lessons learned are shared broadly, which really helps address these issues. And then the market capacity, again, uh, retrofit accelerators doing the retrofits, um, building the capacity by learning by doing, and, and that knowledge sharing from lessons learned and taking on specific market development activities as well. And then ultimately all this work builds the foundation that's needed for governments to enact, you know, um, policy with teeth that will lead to, to, to deep retrofits uh, at scale. Okay, um, and that's the, the end of my presentation. Happy to, um, to chat, uh, talk about if there are any questions or just have a discussion. Also, I just wanted to, to say that um, uh, if anybody wants to reach out uh, after the presentation, um, please, um, happy to, 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 to uh, have, a, have a chat. You can contact, contact me via email or a phone number. We'll make sure that, that that's available to you if, um, if you'd like to talk. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, here we go. Questions in the chat. Great. Okay, so question here. Um, if someone was interested in becoming part of a retrofit accelerator program, what path should they follow? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there really, there isn't a chart, I guess there isn't really a, a clear, a well-defined path to follow today. Um, we're working with some organizations that are kind of looking to do, um, you know, similar work in this space. And, uh, you know, I think the, the federal government in this case has a, has a role to play and is, is trying to uh, to figure that out with the 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 funding that they set aside for retrofit accelerator work, so I think that's um, that's in process, and we're certainly in communication um, with the federal government on that issue. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions?
It was all crystal clear. Sorry about that. So, sorry, which is, oh, Brianne is thanking you for a great presentation. If someone was interested in becoming part of a retrofit accelerator program, what path should they follow? Oh, sorry, I just answered that question. I saw it in the oh. chat, so I just answered Yay. it. Yay! Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No okay, worries, well. no worries at all. Thank you so much. And uh, students, we're off to the coffee chat where, where I can let you know about team presentations and shift and share. Look forward to seeing you there. And Keith, thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone.